एल इन यूर्स कॉलेज प्रेसिडेंट प्रोफेसर तैनता योंग आर सी फोर रेक्टर प्रोफेसर चू चा बेंग डिस्टिंग गेस्ट एंड फ्रेंड्स गुड इवनिंग एंड थैंक्स फॉर जॉइनिंग अस दिस इवनिंग एट दिस पब्लिक लेक्चर बाय प्रोफेसर स्टर्मन ऑन अ टॉपिक ऑफ क्रिटिकल इम्पोर्टेंस एन यूर्स प्रेसिडेंट प्रोफेसर टैनिंग चाय सेंस दिस रिग्रेट्स टू प्रोफेसर स्टर्मन एंड द ऑडियंस for not being able to be here this evening as he is a bit unwell today our former rc4 colleague professor john richardson informed us that professor sturman and his wife cindy were traveling through this region we immediately contacted professor sturman with a request to stop over here and give a talk professor sturman immediately and graciously consented and here we are poised for what promises to be a thought provoking session John David Sturman went to Dartmouth College for his undergraduate degree and obtained his PhD from the MIT Sloan School of Management. Currently he is the J W Forrester Professor of Management and the director of the MIT System Dynamics Group at the MIT Sloan School. He is also co-faculty at the New England Complex Systems Institute. Professor Sturman's uh, research focuses on improving managerial decision making in complex systems. He has pioneered the so-called management flight simulators used for learning to manage the complexity of corporate and economic systems. Professor Sturman has won the J W Forrester Prize for the best published work in system dynamics twice, won an IBM faculty award, won the Accenture award for the best paper of the year published in the California Management Review, and has won awards for teaching excellence 7 times. and was named one of the MIT Sloan School's outstanding faculty by the Business Week Guide to the Best Business Schools. Among his books, the one we at RC4 consult on a daily basis is Business Systems, Business Dynamics, Systems Thinking and Modeling for a Complex World. This book is such an immense treasure of concepts, case studies and challenges. John is acknowledged as the leader of the System Dynamics School of Thought. His words are observed very keenly and he sets the direction and tone for this community of researchers, educators and practitioners. His very recent paper System Dynamics at 60: The Path Forward exhorts those in the field of system dynamics to and I quote, master the state of the art and modern methods to develop, test, communicate and implement rigorous, reliable and effective insights into the dynamics of complex systems wherever they originated. where needed we must innovate to develop new methods to address the pressing challenges we face we must hold ourselves to the highest standards for rigorous inquiry the need is great the path may be difficult end quote at rc4 we as a community have embarked on this journey and have taken the first few yards on this path we will persist improve and offer our small contribution for creating a better tomorrow professor sturman your visit to rc4 and your talk today are very precious and serves as an inspiring event for us before we get into his lecture i wish to record my deepest appreciation for all those who have put in the time and effort to make this event possible people at rc4 office notably ms b chun and mr yu cheng colleagues from cit shaw foundation alumni house student volunteers and many others thank you all finally i request the audience to put our phones on silent mode for the duration of this lecture thank you there will be a 15 minute q and a session following the lecture if you have a question or wish to share a comment please go up to the microphone located on the aisles or put up your hand from your seat so that the microphone will be passed on to you i'm told by the camera crew that if you come and talk at the aisle phones uh, you will be uh, nice and bright on the video that is being created so use the aisle phones uh, microphones if you can Kindly introduce yourself before asking the question or making your comments. In the interest of time, please keep your questions short and sharp. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to invite Professor Sturman to deliver the public lecture. Professor Sturman, please. Thank you very much, Laksh. Thank you. Sir. Well, thank you all very much for coming. I'm delighted to be here. We've really enjoyed our visit to Singapore so far. uh very very impressive indeed including the university and i particularly want to commend residential college 4 for, 
for adopting systems thinking and dynamic modeling as a focal area of inquiry. Uh, I've seen some of the work that the students have done, and it's very, very impressive indeed. And as some of you may know, there's lots of other dynamic modeling, system dynamics work going on here in Singapore, indeed uh, at the, the Duke NUS Medical School Partnership and many, many others. Uh, it's really a, a beacon of activity here and one that is, I think, making a big difference. So I'm very grateful for the invitation and the opportunity and delighted to be with you all today. So let's start out, uh, let me take the temperature of the room, so to speak. How many of you believe that the climate is changing? and that humans are largely responsible for that, and that it, climate change poses grave risks to our prosperity, our health, and our welfare. Though not as many hands went up that time. Uh, and now, how many of you think that there's still a chance that we can prevent those harms? Well, that's good, that's good. So let's find out what's really going on in the world. By the way, although we will try to have Q&A at the end, my philosophy of teaching is, uh, first of all, that I can't teach anybody anything. Laksh was very kind to mention the teaching awards that the students at MIT have uh, conferred, and uh, I'm very grateful to them. But the reality is I can't teach anybody anything. Uh, and the reason, we're going to get into the reason, but basically, especially on difficult, complex issues like climate change, people cannot learn because some expert tells them anything. They can only learn when they have the opportunity to discover those insights for themselves. So that's what we're going to try to do today. This isn't going to be a standard lecture. So if you have a question, shout it out, even during the middle. Feel free to interrupt me. Challenge me. I want that. And then we'll still have Q&A at the end. So as you may know, right now, in Karvice, Poland, the nations of the world are negotiating in COP24, the 24th annual conference of the parties to the United Nations Framework on Climate Change, Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, I'm not there, obviously, but our members of our team are there using the simulation models that I'm about to share with you. And uh, it's, a, it's a contrast. We've been going. Uh, I've, the first one I went to was uh, Copenhagen, COP15, uh, in 2009, and that was uh, a grave disappointment. And ever since then, things have kind of gotten worse. So out on the streets, you can see this photo here, out in the streets, we have people from all over the world who are protesting and demanding, as you can see in this banner, systems change, not climate change. And inside the hall, as you can see in the other picture, we have the diplomats representing nearly 200 nations everywhere in the world. And they are not making progress. They are not making progress. Now, some of you may know that the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, issued a special report in October. This is the special report on 1.5 degree scenarios. Our team contributed research to that report along with many, many other teams around the world. And let me try to summarize the results. So this is a typical slide from that report, which I've modified to be a little bit more readable. And what it shows is how much warming we might have going forward and one degree is where we are already. We have already warmed the planet one degree C above pre-industrial levels. And what they did is they synthesized all the peer-reviewed research to ask the question, what would be the harm of having warming of one and a half degrees, two degrees, and that's basically as far up as they went, two and a half degrees. So as you can see here, if it's white, no problem. Yellow, danger zone. Red, serious widespread impacts and risks. And purple, very high risks of severe irreversible impacts with limited ability to adapt. To put it in the vernacular, as a scientist, if you're in the purple zone, you're screwed. So look at some of these impacts. Corals, especially in low latitudes, in this region of the world, corals will be wiped out even at two degrees. 
Mangroves, extremely important in this part of the world as well as many other regions, will be experiencing detectable risks at two degrees. Low latitude fisheries, that's here. Severe risk, irreversible decline at two degrees. And on and on and on, melting of the Arctic, ecosystem impacts, coastal flooding from sea level rise, fluvial flooding from increased intensity of rainfall, which is something Singapore has already experienced over the last decade, all increasing into the danger zone at even two degrees. Crop yields, it's estimated that even at two degrees, crop yields around the world, including for the big four grains, wheat, corn, rice, and soy, will drop significantly even at two degrees of warming, and that's in a world where we're expected to grow from 7.6 billion people today to almost 10 billion in 2050 and more than 11 billion by 2100, according to the United Nations. Tourism impacts and heat deaths, deaths, morbidity and mortality from extreme heat projected to rise into the danger zone even at two degrees. Where are we headed? Full implementation of the Paris Accord, the 2015 Paris Accord, we estimate with our models, and this is the same for most other groups, would get us to 3.3. Off the scale. And that's if Paris is fully implemented. If it doesn't get implemented, and right now we are not on track, Business as usual carries us well over four degrees. There's no colors in the spectrum that I could find for that level of danger. There's no meaningful way humanity can adapt to a world of four degrees or more of warming. So here we have a situation where if this doesn't scare you, then there's something wrong. And how are we doing reacting to this threat? Well, Christiana Figueres, the former head of the UNFCCC, and a group of colleagues, including myself, just published an article in Nature. Uh, and you can see here the most recent data show that global carbon dioxide emissions actually grew last year, or this year, 2018, expected to grow up to a, an all-time high of more than 37 billion tons, 37 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. And this is all happening at a time when global emissions need to fall. So on the one hand, the scientists are screaming in our sober, measured, academic language, screaming that we have a planetary emergency and nothing seems to be happening. And by the way, the Paris commitments by most nations are grossly inadequate. The United States commitment is grossly inadequate, even if we achieve it, and we are not on track to achieve it. But since we're here in Singapore, let me show you yours. So Singapore's NDC, Nationally Determined Contribution, that is your pledge under the Paris Accord, is to reduce the carbon intensity of your economy by 36% relative to the 2005 level by the year 2030. And that's the dashed red line there. Historical data shows quite a lot of carbon intensity reduction up to about the early 2000s, and it's been flat since then. That drop largely reflects a shifting mix of economic activity here and some sustainability activity. So that looks good. 36% reduction sounds like a big number, but Wait a minute, with that commitment, what will happen to emissions? Carbon intensity is how much carbon is emitted per dollar of real economic activity. But what's happening to your economy? Well, over the last 17 years, since the turn of the millennium, your economy has been growing at 5.3% per year on average in real terms. So that means by 2030, your real GDP is expected to approximately double. Well, total emissions is the product of the carbon intensity, dollars, carbon, sorry, carbon per dollar of GDP, times the GDP, dollars per year. So a 
reduction in intensity multiplied by a doubling of real GDP, you're looking at a 128% increase in emissions. In other words, under the Paris Agreement, Singapore's emissions are going to rise, not fall. And this is the same for all the ASEAN community and for India and for almost all the nations of Central and South America. So what's going on? We have this enormous disconnect between what is needed and what we are doing as a global community. So what's going on? Well, part of the problem is climate is extraordinarily complex. So it's a complex, noisy, dynamical system, perfect for system dynamics, but very, very hard to understand. It's impossible to run experiments. There are very long time delays. If we wait and see how long it's going to take to warm up and how damaging it's going to be, then it's just going to be too late to take action. Worse, climate is a tragedy of the commons situation. You burn carbon, you benefit right now today. The cost of that, the damage from that, the loss of life, the loss of prosperity in the future, that's shared by everybody, including future generations. So it's in your interest to burn carbon because the pain is spread out, but you get the benefits. That's the tragedy of the commons. And there's tremendous inequity. Here's a map showing every nation in the world sized to its carbon footprint. Well, China is the largest emitter. The United States is the second largest emitter. Europe as a community is about the same as India. India is the third largest individual country as an emitter. And you can barely see Africa and you can barely see South America here. So tremendous inequity which creates grievances and a sense of unfairness, which is real. But then it's even worse than that because climate change to understand it requires familiarity with scientific concepts that people don't understand. Scientific concepts, terminology, units of measure, units of measure like parts per million and parts per billion and gigatons of CO2 equivalent emissions per year and watts per square meter of radiative forcing. What? And if you're from the United States, it involves understanding things like degree C, which nobody in my country does understand. <laughs> But it's worse than that. It's not just a question of scientific innumeracy and scientific illiteracy. Public opinion is strongly conditioned by ideology on this issue. So in my country, if you are a progressive or a member of the Democratic Party, you correctly understand that climate change is real, caused by human activity, and poses grave risks. But if you're a conservative, you're much less likely to believe that. That's equivalent to saying that what we deem to be the scientific facts depend on your political orientation. And why is that? That's because there are powerful vested interests that are, who are aggressively working to discredit the science and confuse the public. And by the way, this is exactly the same strategy that the tobacco industry used for decades to try to deflect and delay action to reduce the harm from smoking. And in fact, some of the very same people who helped with that tobacco strategy have been working against climate change policy. And then when you bring up climate change, strong emotions come up. Emotions like fear, anger, denial, helplessness, and despair. And so what happens? What happens is every time I give a talk like this, everybody runs screaming out of the room going, not another lecture on climate change. Here's the problem. The IPCC does this amazing research I just showed you from their last report, and then they present it to the policymakers, they present it to the media, they present it to business leaders, they present it to you, the public, and nothing happens. And the reason is that research shows that showing people research doesn't work. <laughs> and here's an example, right? people attending my last climate science brief. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to stop all that. We're going to do something a little different. You guys are going to negotiate a climate agreement right now in about the next 10, 15 minutes. Uh, now, we don't have a lot of time. When we do this for real with policymakers, with negotiators, with business leaders, with the public, with students all over the world, uh, people have time to prepare. We don't have that time tonight. So we'll just go for it, OK? So 
In order to do that, we're going to use a simulation model that my team and I have developed. It's called C-ROADS, the Climate Rapid Overview and Decision Support System. It's been published in the peer review literature. It was reviewed by an external peer review uh, committee that was chaired by Sir Robert Watson, the former head of the IPCC. You can read here. I won't read this. You can read here their conclusion. Uh, it's all publicly available. All of their critiques, which we have uh, dealt with now, are all publicly available on our website. It's a detailed simulation model, carefully grounded in the best available science, and it kind of looks like this. Here's how it works. And I'm just not going to talk about this. Feel free to ask me questions. And everything here is fully and freely available. You can get the model. You can get all the equations. You can read the technical documentation. You can try it for yourself. You can critique it. You can improve it. And when you do, send it to us, please. So let me tell you, instead of the technical details of how the model works, how has this model been used? Well, since about 2008, it's been used by policymakers and negotiators around the world, and for, for, by the US until the most recent presidential election, uh, <laughs> by China, by Brazil, by France, by a few other countries. The, the UN Secretary General's office used it under uh, Ban Ki-moon, and um, the UN Emissions Gap Studies, the most recent one just published last week, uh, uses it and others. And the people here are a few of the folks who have used it. And when I say used it, I mean they personally used it. They ran the mouse on the computer. So former Secretary of Energy Ernie Moniz, uh, Christiana Figueres, the former head of the UNFCCC, Todd Stern and John Pershing, who were the US Special Envoys for Climate Change, our top climate negotiators. Uh, Professor Hu Kun from China, who's a senior advisor to the Chinese on climate change. One of my team members here, Drew Jones, and then former Secretary of State John Kerry, and he personally used the model, and here's what he had to say about it afterwards. It works, it's important, and it's getting broad dissemination, and I used it, and he really did. He took the mouse away and ran his own scenarios. Uh, it was used by uh, the Obama administration. Here's a quote from John Holdren. I won't read this. Uh, John Holdren was, of course, Obama's uh, science advisor for both terms, uh, and he had it on his White House laptop and uh, used it uh, with their team uh, among other ways, to negotiate not only the Paris Agreement, one of the tools, don't get me wrong, the United States had many analytical tools to help them, but this was one of them, and also to help negotiate the 2014 bilateral agreement between the United States and China. As I mentioned, I briefed Ban Ki-moon on it, and faith leaders around the world have experienced the model as well. So I had the uh, privilege to present it to the Dalai Lama twice, and uh, it was really great. He loves to laugh. And um, of course, that was before I showed him the model. <laughs> After, he's quite a bit more serious. And here's what he had to say. This is serious, and I will join you shouting, shouting, not for selfish reasons, but for the well-being of all humanity. So this is a little bit of background on how the model's been used. But enough talk. Let's do it. So let me get the model going here. And like I say, you're not going to have a lot of time to think about this. We're just going to go for it. Now, this is the exact same model that the policymakers and negotiators have used. The only difference is, because time is short, uh, for educational purposes, we put a simplified interface on the model. But this is not a dumbed down version, not a student version. It's the exact same model. So let me show you how it works. Here we have the year 2000 out to 2100, and in this graph we have emissions of carbon dioxide in gigatons, billion tons per year, historical data up until now with the growth that we just uh, uh, documented uh, up to about 37 gigatons. And then this is the business as usual or current trajectory pathway if nobody lives up to their Paris agreements, which uh, the UN uh, gap report shows we're, we're not living up to right now. And that would carry us uh, to over 100 gigatons per year of emissions by the year 2100. Now, let me stop right there. The year 2100, I know what some of you are saying. 2100? Are you kidding me? I don't even know what I'm doing after dinner. 2100, that's impossibly far away. Nobody knows what's going to happen out to there. Well, it's not far away. Let me ask you all a question. How many of you have children? Can I see some hands? How many of you think you might want to have children someday? It's not a binding commitment. <laughs> and please don't get started until later. 
But can I see all those hands, children, and potentially, yeah, so that's most everybody. So what is life expectancy at birth in Singapore? It's about 82, 83 years. So that means a child born right now can expect to live to the year 2100. And your grandchildren then well beyond the year 2100 if we don't ruin their chances. So that's not far away. That's close. So the other thing you can see here is that the different main nations and groups of nations, the United States in red, the European Union in green, the other developed nations, that's uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Russia and the former Soviet republics, Japan, Singapore, they're all projected to grow. China is here, India is here, and all the other developing nations of the world are here. And all of them are projected to have growth in their emissions. Now over here, the simulation shows you the temperature, the expected temperature increase that uh, would result from those emissions. And you can see that we blast through the two degree limit, the most that the Paris Agreement is willing to contemplate, uh, before 2050. And we blast through one and a half before 2035. That's right around the corner, right around the corner. And we end up at 4.2 in warming. Now, I could show you what's going on here with a lot more detail. We could look at the uh, population projection. We have the UN medium fertility population projection here, which carries us to 11.2 billion. We can change that. We're not going to do that today. We don't have the time. And almost all that population growth is in the developing world, not in the uh, already developed world where the demographic transition has already proceeded. Uh, we're assuming, as all models do and all countries desire and all companies desire and all individuals desire, that everybody keeps getting wealthier and wealthier. Economic growth continues everywhere in the world. So uh, you can look at that as GDP per capita, real GDP per capita. So everywhere in the world, people continue to, uh, to grow wealthier and wealthier. Uh, and we can look at lots more data. Uh, we can also look at how well this model compares to the large models that the IPCC uses in its reports. And well, let's look at the history of carbon dioxide concentration. So you can't see it there, but there's actually two lines there. The model is the black line, and underneath it, these uh, tan lines are the actual data. And the model matches that essentially perfectly. And if we look at the projections from the IPCC, these are the different scenarios for the IPCC uh, that they look at, which if you're a, an aficionado, they are known as the RCPs. And they go from low emissions to very high emissions. And the model tracks those perfectly as well. And if we look at temperature, Let's look at uh, temperature projections. Once again, the model tracks those essentially perfectly. The difference between the big models that the IPCC uses and this model is this model runs in less than a second on my laptop, whereas the large models can take weeks or months to run a single simulation. So those models are essential for progress in climate research, absolutely essential. And at the very same time, because they weren't designed for it, they are absolutely useless in negotiations and policy making. Because you need to know. They've got two weeks in Poland. You need to know what a, what a proposal is going to do, essentially, immediately. OK, so let's go back to um, the default graphs here. And I'm going to stack, uh, stack up the emissions. And now the question is, what will the different countries and groups of countries do? So, this is a big, big group, but let's see what we can do. So over here, this triangle here, you're the United States. Okay, President Trump, right there. <laughs> okay, uh, why don't we make the uh, the first three rows here? Yeah, uh, maybe the first two rows. You're the European Union. Okay, so Angela Merkel, right there. <laughs> the next. Three rows, now the next two rows, okay, the next two rows, you are the other developed nations, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, former Soviet republics, et cetera, and uh, right there, President Putin. 
and you can be Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, so that takes us up there. The next three, four rows, all the way back there, you folks are China, the world's largest emitter and uh, the world's largest population. You folks in the back, India, third largest emitter. And everybody over here, including way up there, you folks are the other developing nations. So that's all of Southeast Asia, ex-Singapore, you're a developed country, Singapore, so you're in with the Russia-Australia group. Uh, uh, all of South Asia, except for India, uh, all of Africa, Middle East, the island states, and Central and South America, okay? So th there's many emerging, rapidly growing economies in this group, Brazil, Indonesia, Malaysia, et cetera, but also the poorest of the poor in the world are here, all right? Now, I'm gonna give you five minutes, that's it, five minutes to figure out what your proposal is to cut your emissions. You may know that ever since the Copenhagen conference failed to come up with a legally binding treaty, we have had a voluntary system. The Paris Agreement was a voluntary agreement. You simply decide, as the United States, this is what we're willing to do. Europe, this is what we're willing to do. And there's no consequence if you fail to do it. So it's a system of promises, but that's the way we're gonna run the simulation. So United States, Europe, other developed countries, China, India, other developing countries, get together, get up out of your seats. You gotta talk to yourselves, get up, talk to one another, and here's what you have to decide. You have to decide how much, if at all, you are willing to lower your emissions. And we're gonna keep it really simple. So the first thing is, in what year are you willing to stop the growth of your emissions? You can see that under business as usual, emissions are growing for everybody out through the end of the century. Why? Growing population, growing economy, increasing GDP per capita, and that growth, as I showed you for Singapore, outweighs the efficiency improvements that happen under business as usual. So in what year, if any, are you willing to stop the growth of your emissions? You can say, we're not gonna stop the growth of our emissions. We need to grow to develop our economy. That's entirely up to you. But you might say, well, 2030, 2040, 2050, you could say tomorrow. Whatever you decide, that's entirely up to you. Your next decision is, are you going to cut your emissions? So in what year, if any, are you willing to begin a decline in your emissions? And if so, at what annual percentage rate? Half a percent, one percent. The fastest emissions have ever fallen for any country over an extended period of time is for Northern European countries, Germany, the Scandinavian countries, uh, after the first oil shock in 1973. And for about a decade, their emissions fell at about four, four and a half, maybe 5% a year. Then they started to go up again. So that gives you a little bit of uh, reference for what you might want to do there. You could have more, but it would require uh, extraordinary uh, putting your economy on a war footing, basically, and mobilizing as, say, you know, the Allies did in Second World War. So those are those decisions. And then there's forestry decisions. And uh, basically, what percentage are you willing to cut deforestation in your country? Uh, or region, and what percentage of potential afforestation, planting new trees on previously degraded land, are you willing to do? Okay, so that's it. In what year are you willing to stop the growth of your emissions, if you're willing to do that at all? In what year are you willing to have your emissions start to fall, if you're willing to do that at all, and at what annual rate? And then some forestry policies. Okay, now you negotiate. Get together with your people. I'm gonna give you about five minutes, that's it. You don't have a lot of time, let's call the question. So all the delegates will come to order, and we'll hear first from the United States of America. We, uh, we will hear from uh, the President of the United States, the Honorable Donald J. Trump, right there. So, what are you willing to do, sir? Right, I'm sorry I don't have my red tie today. <laughs> but what we said is that, um, after my next term. <laughs> okay, so 2025. 
So there will be somebody else, I believe, and um, <laughs> if everything goes well for them, uh, they should start then implementing reductions, so that will be the reductions. Uh, so 2025 to peak? No, not for to 10 years after that. So 2035 Five. to peak? Yes. So 2035. Now, watch the red band at the bottom here when I enter this. Not my fault. <laughs> it flattened out, and that's how fast the model runs. And that took 0.1 degree off of the expected warming. Now, are you willing to have your emissions drop, sir? Uh, the next, uh, next administration. <laughs> so after 2035? Yes. So 2040, something like that? Yep. 2040, at what percentage rate? Uh, we voted, because you know this, this is a democracy here, so we said 2%. 2% per year. Now watch the red band, and now it's shrinking. So by 2100, you the see? United States is on its way, not there yet, but on its way to a prosperous, carbon-free economy. Uh, and that took total 0.2 de degrees off of the expected warming. So thank you very much, sir. You're now, welcome. because time is short, I'm going to skip the forestry policies. Deforestation contributes between 10 and 15 percent of total carbon emissions. So if you cut it to zero around the world, it would help, but it's not going to solve the problem. It would be very important, it is very important to do that, to prevent habitat loss and extinction and changes in the hydrological cycle, water uh, availability, and uh, these are very, very important. But in terms of climate change, you can't solve this problem with trees alone. So we're going to just skip that in the interest of time, and we'll hear from the European Union. So Angela Merkel, Chancellor Merkel, your swan song. So 2030. And a drop? 2019. Oh, so, okay. So we have to back up then. So uh, you're going to uh, stop your growth basically now. <laughs> that, that is, in fact, their plan. And uh, have a drop in the same year at what percentage rate? 2%. So watch that green band. Now Europe, because they're starting earlier, is running a prosperous green economy uh, with almost no fossil fuel by the year 2100. Terrific. How about the Russia, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Singapore group? So, uh, where's President Putin? Okay. <laughs> Give me a year. In what year are you willing to stop the growth of emissions from your group? No. Never. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I think so, that's some tough negotiations here. China. China, what are you willing to do? Where is uh, Xi Jinping? <laughs> Xi Jinping, right there. Okay. 2025. 2025 to stop the growth. That makes a difference because you're the largest emitter in the world today. Now, are you willing to have your emissions decline? Yes, they are. Starting in what year? 35. At what rate? That's very, very ambitious, but it's your simulation, so let's do it. Now we're at three and a half. Okay, India, India, are you willing to do anything? Prime Minister Modi, what are you willing to do? Uh, yeah, not now. In 2040, we will start. 2040? Yeah. To stop the growth? And 2050. 2050? Yeah. At what rate? Oh. 1.5. 1.5. Okay. Uh, and then the other developing countries, this is the emerging countries, but also the poorest of the poor. So what are you folks willing to do? Not going to cut. Nothing. <laughs> your goal is to develop your economy and lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. That's very sensible. So nothing. So here's where we are. 3.4 degrees of expected warming by 2100. And take a look, we crossed the one and a half and the two degree threshold basically exactly the same time as under business as usual. So although this is better, it is not safe. And so what would happen? What would some of the consequences be of 3.4? And by the way, although the details are somewhat different in your pledges, let me show you what our estimate of the full and complete implementation of Paris 
would be. It's that yellow line. It's, you, basically, you have come up with the Paris Agreement. Now, the, de the, details, the details are a little different. In the real world, uh, the United States pledged to decline. You're not pledging anything. Europe declining, very similar to uh, what you actually did. Uh, China pledged to peak in 2030 and not to decline. That's their official pledge. Although a lot of the people I know in, from the US government who helped in the negotiations believe China could in fact do it by 2025 and might even be on track to do it by 2025. India pledged basically nothing, an increase, just like Singapore, right? A reduction in intensity, but economic growth far faster. So emissions would grow, not peak. And uh, your group basically the same thing. So this is pretty similar to the Paris Agreement. Now, what would the consequences of that be? Well, let me turn off Paris, and let's look at some impacts. So the first impact, let's look at, uh, uh, let's see. Let's look at the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The thin black line is business as usual, and the purple line is your scenario. And it's lower, but it still goes up well above the danger threshold. Today, it's already higher than it's ever been in the entire existence of human beings. And under your scenario, it continues to grow and uh, almost doubles. Uh, so that's not it moving in the right direction. And let's look at a couple other impacts. The temperature we've looked at. Now, what about the acidification of the ocean? Carbon dioxide dissolves in the ocean and it becomes carbonic acid, and the chemistry doesn't matter. You either already know it, or you can look it up later. But it basically means that the ocean becomes more acidic. And that's a problem, because more acidic ocean water causes the uh, dissolution of carbonate shells. And if the diatoms and the zooplankton and all the other creatures that make shells from microscopic to large scale are in more acidic water, they can't survive. And this is already happening. You can see it's already declining. And it's still declining under your scenario, just not quite as fast. And finally, let's look at one more impact, uh, and that's sea level rise. Now, before we do that, I should mention that the model is based on the best available peer-reviewed science. So the parameters in the model, the assumptions in the model are grounded in the best knowledge that scientists have. But there is uncertainty. And the science keeps moving. So we don't require you to accept our assumptions. You can ask us to change assumptions. So let's just take a look at how that might be done for a few of them. So there's a variety of assumptions here about how the climate works that you could play with. And uh, for example, uh, well, let me go back before I do that to um, temperature. Uh, you know, you might decide that the climate is more sensitive to carbon dioxide than scientists currently believe, but 4.5 for this parameter is actually within the 95% confidence interval, and that means we'd really be in trouble. Or it could be a little less, and then things would be a little better, but still over 2 degrees. One area where we know that the model is behind the science because the science is evolving very, very rapidly is sea level rise and the contribution of sea level rise from ice sheet melting, Greenland, Antarctica, and so forth. The, uh, the last IPCC report, AR5, which was published five years ago, is already very far out of date. And today, the best evidence is that the ice sheets are melting faster than we thought even just five years ago. So I'm going to move this assumption and add 0.6 millimeters per year per degree of warming of extra sea level rise. Now, uh, and that's pretty conservative. Now let's look at sea level rise. About two meters by 2100. And then it just keeps going after that. So what would that mean? What would that mean? Well, let's take a look at a couple of impacts. So this is an interactive map of the world, and we can zoom in on anywhere you want. And I know where you want to zoom in on first, so that's <laughs> going to be Singapore. So I got to find it. So let me <laughs> let me center it. Now I know where it is. I just got to find it on the map. 
And uh, what you can do is you can dial in different amounts of sea level rise here. The data here come from NASA. And uh, you know it's not perfect. It's not as highly resolved as you might like. So here we are today. And if we have two meters of sea level rise on top of that, well, you know, it's pretty hard to see what's going on. So I actually have another visualization of this that you might like to see. And this one's got more resolution. So on the left, we have the historic level of uh, CO2. So this is basically today. And on the right, Singapore, sea level rise with four degrees of warming. You have 4.2 under business as usual. We can try uh, three. Three is closer to yours, your scenario. So let's look at three. So do you see the central business district? It's gone. The airport is gone. All of this. Now, the university here is on a bit of a hill, but that hardly matters. <laughs> that hardly matters. This would be catastrophic for your nation. But you know what? This isn't the most important thing. You really ought to care about what's happening in other parts of the world. So let me go back to zero. And let's look at, oh, I don't know. Let's look at China. Huge trading partner for you. Very important in the world economy. And let's look at Shanghai. So Shanghai is here. And let's zoom in a little bit. OK. Now, many of you have been to Shanghai. You know it's a coastal city. Most of the great cities of the world are coastal cities for obvious reasons. It's a low-lying delta area. And uh, you can see there's already some areas. The little blue dots are already sort of at sea level today. Let's look at two meters of sea level rise. That's basically an uninhabitable metropolis now, because that means there's saltwater intrusion in the uh, groundwater. It means there's high tide flooding, sunny day flooding, something we already experience in Miami, for example. And of course, that's not the worst of it, because here, unlike in Singapore, you are vulnerable to typhoons. Does anybody know how high the storm surge was in, say, uh, Typhoon Haiyan that hit the Philippines a few years ago, or the more recent one. How big was the storm surge? Does anybody here know? I'll tell you. Four meters. Four meters. So let's add, even though it would be temporary, let's add four meters to this after two meters of sea level rise. So a serious typhoon. And the, the research suggests, and the data, that typhoons and hurricanes are becoming more intense and more damaging. So four meters of sea level rise on top of the two. Total devastation. I could show you Shenzhen. It's the same story. So China, you are going to lose your most important economic and population centers if you allow this to happen. And that's by 2100. It'll, it'll, it'll be much, much worse. You, know, you don't suppose sea level is only one meter by the middle of the century, and so then the typhoon comes at five. It doesn't really matter. You're going to lose your most important economic powerhouses and population centers. So China, it's in your interest to do something about this problem. Let me show you just a couple other places really quickly, places that you should care about here in Singapore, places that everybody should care about no matter where they live. So let's look at the Ganges Delta here and zoom in. Now, this is already a very low-lying delta region. And uh, people are already, even at one degree, being displaced from their marginal lands here because of saltwater intrusion and flooding. But let's add two meters of sea level rise to that. And now you've got tens of millions of climate refugees on the border of Bangladesh and India. And many of those refugees today, they head to Dhaka where they don't have many opportunities for good employment. And they often end up working in uh, sweatshops in the garment industry, making all the cheap clothing that everybody in the world buys. Uh, and Dhaka will be greatly inundated as well. You do get typhoons in the Bay of Bengal here. So let's add a three meter storm surge. And you have a climate catastrophe on the border of Bangladesh and India. 
maybe just one more. Let's go over to the Indus Valley. So the Indus, of course, is a contested border, contested politically, geographically, contested in terms of the water. And it's already a very low-lying area. You can see the border here. Let's add two meters of sea level rise. That's a mass migration of climate refugees on a hot border between two countries who don't get along all that well today. And oh, by the way, they both have nuclear weapons. Sometimes when I run this uh, in the middle of the United States, people will say to me, well, I live in Denver. We're 5,000 feet, 20 whatever, 2,000 whatever meters above sea level. Why should I care about sea level rise? This is why. And that's just sea level rise. I haven't shown you the impact from crop yield decline, from increasing disease ranges, from any of the other harms from climate change. So here's the thing. You have got to do better. You have got to negotiate a better agreement than this. So I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes. Get back together with your people. <laughs> no, we can't leave it like this. You're dooming yourselves and your children to a world of pain. You've got to do better. It's clearly in your interest, China, to do better because you're going to lose. India, you will lose. United States, you're going to lose. I didn't show you, but you're going to lose Louisiana, South Florida. Mr. President, you're going to lose Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> and much of the best agricultural land in the United States will be gone because of these impacts. Same thing everywhere in the world. Get back together. We're locking the doors. Nobody goes out. Nobody has a bathroom break until we come up with a better agreement. Let's go. <laughs> Adequate for such a momentous and weighty issue, but let's see what you got. So, United States, what are you willing to do? All right, so I finally hired a scientific advisor. Um, and I got the best mind for this job. So, uh, so we decided to go for 2019 for the peak year. Really? Yeah. OK. All right. And uh, 2020, we said, for the reductions to begin. Yep. And we'll be big, uh, very big on this. Tremendously big, 5%. OK. OK? That's really ambitious, but it's your simulation, so uh, we should send you to Katowice tonight. Uh, so that's great. We're, we're still at, um, so all that ambition by the United States, which is enormously welcome, and also sets an example for all the other countries, right? What you hear ever since Paris is, if the US won't do it, why should we? So this is enormously important. Thank you, sir. Now, what about the European Union? You, you, know, you're, you can't really accelerate the timing. Yeah, what are cannot, you willing to do? We cannot go back in time. <laughs> so the annual reduction rate will go for 7 percentage. OK, so I just, <laughs> I got to tell you, that's not really realistic. But, you know, <laughs> let's go ahead and do it. So that means the EU is running a completely carbon-free economy by about 2050, 2060. Wow. That's great. Now, how are you going to do that? That's another question. The interesting thing about the Paris Accord is you don't have to say how you're going to do it, and you don't have to actually have any implemented policies to do it. But to get that, you would have to have a very high carbon price. Under the European trading system now, I haven't looked in the last couple of weeks, but it's 20 euros a ton. It's very, very low. That's not going to be enough. You might be looking at 100 euros a ton. Uh, and, you know, they're rioting in Paris right now over a few euro cents per liter on gasoline. I'm not sure you're going to get that done, but it's great to see that ambition. Now, what about, what about uh, the other developing group? So uh, where's Prime Minister Trudeau? Go ahead. Right. Well, go for it. Go for it. What are you going to do here? So, we hired a Chinese assassin to get rid of Putin. <laughs> Chinese are efficient in these things. All right. So, um, 
So I think we can peak in 2030 because there are still a couple of countries that need to grow a lot. And then reduction should start about five years later. But I think one of the important things that we can do with a lot of big countries is to really promote afforestation. So put that at like two or three percent a year. So two 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 percent per year decline. Oh, the reduction, uh, we can uh, let's do three. We'll do the same as China because I think that's also quite likely that people make these contingent promises. But I want to add the afforestation for our okay, region. Great. So you, uh, there's a lot of forest in Canada and Russia, for example. Exactly. Uh, so how much of a deforestation reduction do you want? Oh, hundred percent. Hundred percent. Of course. And, and how much afforestation relative to the potential do you want? 100%? Uh, per year, right? No, that's or, just... Or that's in total. It takes time to deploy all those trees oh. and then for them to grow. Yeah. question is, if that's the potential, how much of that? I'd say 50 and also 100 in the developing nations. We'll pay for it. You'll pay for that. Well, great. <laughs> okay. We're down to three. What about China? 2030. Great. At annual rate of 4%. 4%. Great. That makes a difference. Uh, and uh, are you guys uh, from the EU or from the other developing countries, you're willing to pay for China's afforestation, deforestation reduction? Yeah, we're doing other, developed. other developed, okay. Are, is China willing to do something on forestry? So give me a number. 100%? Great, so that might be enough to keep the panda from going extinct in the wild. So we'll try that. We're at 2.9, ladies and gentlemen. India, what are you willing to do? India, Prime Minister Modi. Uh, in 2030, we will start. Uh, 2030? Yeah. And are you willing to uh, uh, change that decline time? In 2040. 2040. And we want to increase the annual reduction rate by 2.5%. 2.5. Yeah. OK. Great. And 50 uh, percentage. 50 percent. Yeah. Maybe that'll save the Bengal tiger. I don't know. <laughs> Afforestation. Yeah, someone have to fund us, so we you know, <laughs> that. Can we try 50 percent then? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, and now the other developing countries. This is the largest block as a block. Billions of people, all striving to grow and develop. 2050. 2060, all right, so 2050, 2060, 60, at what rate? 1.5. 1.5, and we're at 2.4 degrees. Uh, any forestry policies? You have the Amazon, you have the Indonesian rainforest, you have the Malaysian rainforest, 100% deforestation reduction, and uh, how about replanting some of those lands that have already been degraded? They're paying 75%. OK. Well, take a look at this. We're at 2.3 degrees. This is not safe, but it is a dramatically less harmful world that you've created. And now the question is, and, and notice what has to happen. Emissions basically have to peak in the next decade and fall dramatically. To get to two. You have to peak before 2030, and you have to decline even faster. Now, I'm going to turn to the question of can we, in fact, do that? But before we do, there's one other scenario I think is worthwhile looking at. In the UN negotiations, going back all the way to the Rio conference in the early 1990s, which is the the result of which is the process we have today, the, the, uh, the UNFCCC process. All the way back then, the developing countries of the world argued that they needed to develop their economy. They furthermore argued that the developed countries, the United States, Europe, Japan, Australia, Canada, et cetera, that they got developed by burning fossil fuels. And we can actually look at the data we can look at um, the uh, cumulative emissions historically. And you can see that up until about now, the United States 
Europe and the other developed nations contribute about two-thirds of all the carbon that has been burned since the Industrial Revolution. And so the argument was, and still is today, that the developed countries need to cut even more aggressively than your current projection, even more aggressively than what's coming from the other developed countries. And then the developing nations, they argued, they get to continue to burn fossil fuel as a way to get rich. And this is enshrined in the official treaty that established the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change with the famous phrase, common but differentiated responsibilities. Common responsibilities because we all live in the same planet and there's no hiding from the impacts of climate change, no matter where you live. But differentiated responsibilities to recognize the fact of the wealth disparities and the historical responsibility for creating most of the climate damage. So let's run a little experiment. Let's go back to the base case and look at what would happen, hypothetically, if all the emissions from all the developed economies of the world could instantly go to zero. Obviously, that's impossible, but just as an extreme case. So right now in 2018, and in 2018, we'll drop our emissions at 100% per year for the United States. So the United States emissions basically go to zero right away. And we'll do the same thing for Europe. And we'll do the same thing for all the other developed countries. So this is that scenario. The Western countries, the developed countries, all drop their emissions to zero immediately. And the rest of the world gets to follow the historic development path using fossil fuels. 3.4. It simply isn't possible anymore. And so when you look at a country like Singapore, when you look at Africa, when you look at India, when you look at even China, when you look at any of the developed economies, and they're all projecting a rise in their emissions, often indefinitely, on the grounds that they need to develop their economy in any way, how dare the Western nations who got rich burning fossil fuels, how dare they say to the rest of the world, you can't do that too? Well, it doesn't work. China will lose. Shenzhen, Shanghai, India will lose. Indonesia, and by the way, Singapore, will lose, will be in serious trouble. It's not possible anymore. So I think what we have to do is redefine common but differentiated responsibilities. There is a legitimate moral case that the Western nations, the developed countries, wherever they are, including Singapore now that you're a rich country, have an obligation to help everybody solve this problem. But it can't be done by letting those countries burn. It has to be done by providing the know-how, the technology, and the financial assistance so that all countries in the world can cut their emissions. If every country doesn't cut, there is no solution for this problem. Geoengineering is not a solution to this problem either. Number one, it doesn't work. It hasn't been proven. Number two, once you start it, you can't stop because the planet would warm up very quickly again. And there are unknown, possibly serious uh, ecological harms from it. So we have that in one of our models. Uh, and in fact, let me, let me show you that now. So this model, I think, you did a great job, by the way. And notice what happened. The first round, everybody more or less plays their national interest the way it's narrowly defined historically. So this group, no cut. India, very small cut. China, we'll, we'll peak, we won't fall much. And the rich countries did a little bit, and the United States didn't do much. Uh, that's very, very typical of where we are right now today with the Paris Agreement, and we're falling short of that. And then what happened? Although there was a lot of laughter in the room when I showed you what happens to Shanghai, when I showed you what happens, it got a little quieter. I hope you noticed that. It got a little quieter when you began to see what happens just with sea level rise 
to countries in this region on the Indus Delta, on the Ganges Delta. And I think that's because people began to realize what this really means in a way that you can't just by looking at the scientific reports or you begin to feel it. Now, this is a large group. We can't do what we usually do. When we usually run this in classes or in workshops, we actually have a blue sheet. And when sea level rise goes up by that much, if it does, depends on what people do. But if it goes up by that much, we get out that sheet and we drag it over the heads of the participants. And we'll muss up their hair and we knock over their drinks because sea level rise is not a joke. And yes, yeah, sometimes their pants get wet or their notebook gets covered with coke. That's OK. And then what happens is the next round, where you did very much better, you got to 2.3. It's because people suddenly realize we will, we will lose. We will be harmed. It's in our national interest to be much more aggressive than we were in the first round. That's what's missing in the current process. Now, it's easy. I, I understand it's easy for you to promise large reductions in early years and to offer to pay for deforestation reduction because it isn't real money. But I actually believe that this makes a difference. And the evidence is clear. Now, here's the, here's the question. Two remaining questions, and then we'll, we'll take some questions from you. One is, can we do it technologically, economically? Can we do it? And for that, I'm going to show you another, another model real quickly. And then the question is, can we do it politically? Can we muster the will? to get the changes we need implemented. So let's first look at another model that we've developed. And this model is um, very similar to the one you just saw. But now we are looking at the energy system. So on the left, so this, because of time being so short, this is a global level treatment for right now. Okay. So on the left graph, we've got the production of energy. Coal is black, oil is red, natural gas in blue, renewables in green, et cetera, bioenergy, nuclear, and something we call new tech, uh, a magical carbon-free energy source with, uh, you know, think of thorium nuclear power or tabletop fusion or the flux capacitor, whatever you like. Uh, and you can see historical data up till now and then projections going forward. And then that drives emissions and that drives the climate sector in the same model you just saw. 4.2 degrees under business as usual. And here are real policy levers that you can play with. So what would you like to do? How do we get to two degrees or even, even below? What, what's the single most important policy that the nations of the world could implement? If you, you know, if you could only take one policy with you to a desert island, what would it be? Carbon taxes, great. So let's take a look at that. Carbon price is down in the bottom there and uh, Let's, let's do that. Uh, let me move this up a little bit. So that would be a low tax. That takes off 0.2. Let's look at a medium-sized tax, 3.7. And a high tax, we're already at 3.3. Now, what does that really mean? Well, it means uh, we're at $79 per US dollars per ton of carbon dioxide uh, starting in 2019. Uh, actually, we should phase that in over 10 years, probably. Okay. Now, um, uh, let's make it a little bigger. Let's make it a nice round number like 100. OK, $100 a ton. That's what the carbon price would do, phased in gradually. And we're at 3.2 just with that. Now, why is that so effective? Because it creates incentives for everybody, commercial, industrial, residential, transportation, for everybody to find ways to lower their carbon use by substituting for renewables and more energy efficiency everywhere. So is that ridiculous? Well, $100 a ton is 90 US cents, 92 US cents per gallon of gasoline. So it's less than a quarter per liter. Okay, That's not very much. That still leaves the price of gasoline in the United States, for example, far below the level that it is here in Singapore. Now, it's too low everywhere in the world, including in Singapore, including in Europe. But it's not a ridiculous amount. And what do you do with the money? How do you get this to be politically acceptable? You give the money back to the people. 
as a dividend check. And there are many states and provinces and cities around the world and a growing number where carbon prices have in fact been implemented and uh, the economy is doing quite well, thank you very much, like British Columbia, uh, the European trading system, uh, the states, the New England states where I live has, uh, has a carbon price. It doesn't get us everywhere we want to go, but it certainly helps. What else would you like to do? So, what about coal? Get rid of coal. So one thing we could do is we could tax or otherwise impose regulations that would require the phase out of coal faster. Uh, so let's, let's do that. Because you see, even, let me go back here, even with the carbon price, there's still plenty of coal being used around the world because coal is exceptionally cheap and there's lots and lots of it. So let's recognize coal's particular damage here and we'll tax it. And now we're at 3.1. We're phasing it out. Now we can do even more here. What about the existing coal plants? Uh, we could accelerate the retirement of existing coal plants by, let's say, 5% a year. That helps maybe even more. How about 10% a year. Now, you'd probably have to pay the operators of those coal plants a certain amount of money in order for them to be willing to do this, but not as much as you might think because their assets are gonna be stranded anyway and they're gonna be bankrupt as most of the coal producers are already. So, that's helping, we're at 3.1. What else would you like to do? Go ahead. Reduce, reduce meat consumption with at least 50% labor. Okay, now let me see how can we do that here. Well, one way we can do that here is so we can cut methane. Now, methane, a fair amount of the methane comes from agriculture, especially from livestock, but a lot of it also comes from natural gas production by leakage. So uh, let's cut it quite a bit. That matters a lot. And we, if you aren't uh, consuming, if people aren't consuming as much uh, meat in their diet, they'll be healthier, but also you don't need to cut down as much of the Indonesia and the Amazon uh, and the other rainforests to, to plant them over with soy and other livestock feed. So we can cut deforestation as well. Now remember this is global. Let's, we'll cut it a lot. We're at 2.6. What else would you like to do? I, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Population, very interesting. So we have the United Nations scenarios here. There it is. And uh, now it turns out this is actually rather high leverage, but you can't cut it all that much because of the inertia in social norms about family size and age of childbearing and so forth. But let's, let's cut it a little bit. Uh, and uh, that matters. I don't think you can cut it realistically much more than this, but, uh, but that matters. Maybe let's, let's go here. Great. So I like the way you're thinking, right? It's not just about the carbon system. You're thinking bigger picture. What else would you like to try? Oil. What about, so we could tax oil in the same fashion. Increasing. And that helps. But notice what's happening there. You get more natural gas when you do that. Well, that helps a little, but it's still a fossil fuel. Interestingly, nobody has suggested anything on the demand side other than the carbon tax. So what about here, energy efficiency? What about it? So, you know, Singapore is pretty interesting. There's a lot of really beautiful architecture and some very highly sustainable buildings, but there's a lot of really inefficient, energy inefficient buildings here that don't have good windows, don't have good insulation, don't have good uh, cooling systems. So let's impose some regulations that would ramp up the energy efficiency. Now this only applies to new investment and some retrofits, but that helps quite a lot. And then we can also do the same for transportation. And that does a lot because you're getting rid of uh, energy, carbon intensive uh, liquid fuels, especially uh, gasoline and diesel and bunker fuels and aviation fuels. Uh, what else would you like to do? We could at forest, so we'll plant some trees. Medium, how about high tree planting? We're almost at two. And uh, you know, for those of you who like geoengineering, we have CDR, that's carbon dioxide removal, that's here, but it's all speculative. For example, to, um, to do uh, biochar on a scale that would take 
three, four, five gigatons per year out of the emissions budget, you would need an amount of land bigger than all of India. Well, that amount of land is not available. And so that's not a practical solution here. But there is one other thing we can do. Um, renewables? Well, OK, so let's, let's subsidize our renewables. And that green line goes way up. Um, but there wasn't much of a change in the temperature. Part of the problem here is if you make energy cheaper, people want to use more of it. So you get a rebound effect. But you do have a lot more renewables here. Uh, and we could work on natural gas. That helps a little. And let's electrify the, uh, the world economy here. Once you've got a green electricity system, then electrifying transportation, electrifying uh, buildings and industrial operations so you can run them off solar with storage and it becomes much more feasible. Well, here we are at 1.9, and what you see here is, yeah, the carbon price, that is the one policy you should take with you to the desert island, but it's still not enough. There's no silver bullet, but there is silver buckshot. It's going to take many different policies, and the mix will vary by nation, but this is technically possible. This is technically possible. We don't need a radical breakthrough in order to stay at, at two degrees, have a decent chance of staying at two. What we do need is we need immediate action using the technologies that we have today, ready to go, off the shelf, proven, safe technologies. Can you sell for free? Can I, sorry? Can you sell for free? Can, uh, I still could. Can you Ah, can I sell it politically? Thank you. So that's the next question. Before we do that, though, I want to show you one other scenario. So let's go back. Sorry. Let me reset. And uh, what I often hear, and I heard it in the room when I was walking around during the negotiation, is, well, what about a technical breakthrough? So there are folks like Bill Gates, who uh, has funded, along with some other billionaires, the Breakthrough Foundation. I've met many of the people there, and they're good people, and they're working on can we, so what Bill Gates has said is, what we need to solve the climate problem is not a carbon price and regulations and all of this. What we need is a technical breakthrough that would produce carbon-free energy at half the price of coal. Carbon-free, for obvious reasons, half the price of coal because the market won't take it if it's not cheap. So let's do that. We created, specifically for him, uh, and other people who ask about this, this idea of new tech. New tech is right here, and it's a magical carbon-free technology, and we can decide how big the breakthrough is. Well, let's look at a huge breakthrough. So what does a huge breakthrough mean? It means that uh, the breakthrough would happen um, basically immediately. Let's change that to today. And uh, 12 years to commercialize, that's very, very short compared to any of these technologies. You know, the ITER project, that's the fusion project being built in France right now. It's always 20 years away. And there's no guarantee that it'll ever generate any, uh, any uh, energy at all. So, um, so let's ramp that up all the way. So that's that orange line. And it takes off like a rocket but you only get 0.2 degrees of benefit. Now, why is that? I mean, that is about, that is faster than any new energy technology has ever grown in the history of this world. The demand side was good. So say, that, yeah, so exactly right. The rate of growth here is so great because it's cheap. And because it's cheap, the average cost of energy falls. When you flip the light switch, you don't care where those electrons came from. Did they come from new tech that had no emissions or did they come from a coal plant in Malaysia? You don't care. You just know this is how much I pay my electric bill and with new tech, it's cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So why should I turn off the lights? Why don't I turn my air conditioner from 24 to 19? Why don't I just buy a bigger car? And so you get a rebound effect. That's part of it. And the other part, of course, is it doesn't get big until after 2050. 
even though the breakthrough is today, and there's 12 years of commercialization on average, and then construction of these plants all over the world. It's too little, too late, and it's too cheap. And if you make it not as cheap, then the market doesn't take it as fast, and you're back with fossil fuels. Now, what that means is it would be lovely to have a huge technical breakthrough, but it doesn't solve the problem. Furthermore, if you have a carbon price, then more investment in new technology research will happen because it'll be economically more attractive, and the chances of a breakthrough will go up. So get that carbon price put into place. And I know Singapore is moving in that direction, although the value of the carbon price that's being discussed is far, far too low, as it is everywhere in the world. So technically, we can do this. So now we come to the question of politically, can we do it? So this is the big challenge. Solving climate change, creating a world in which you and your children and all the children can thrive is not a scientific problem. It is not an engineering problem. It's not an economic problem. It's highly affordable. It's a political and social and psychological problem. So let me show you a couple of examples of why I am hopeful about this. So let's see. I'll give you just a couple. So around the world today, the cost of renewable energy, wind power, for example, has fallen dramatically. That's not because of sudden flashes of genius. It's because of the steady incremental reduction in costs that come from learning and scale economies and developing standards so that wind turbines can be integrated into the electrical grid. And global wind capacity is now 500, approximately 500 gigawatts and growing very, very rapidly around the world. And it's the same for solar power. Solar power global capacity is doubling about every two years. And every time that happens, the costs go down by 20%. And that learning curve, the bottom graph here, has been going on for uh, many, many decades. It is now cheaper than fossil power. So last year, this is just last year in the United States, the electric utility in Colorado put out a bid to the producers. Low bid for power, steady power, not intermittent power, wins. What won? They awarded those contracts to solar farms and wind farms because it's cheaper to design, permit, build, maintain, and operate wind farms and solar with storage than it is to run an existing coal plant. And that's true in many countries around the world today. So renewables beat fossil now. Now what about on the energy efficiency side? So this is the, uh, my business school, the School of Management at MIT. This building was um, built in the early 2000s. I was co-chair of the building committee, and I and my colleagues pushed for it to be a green, sustainable building. It's, uh, you can read some of the parameters here. It's won a couple prizes. It's a typical building like you have on your campus here. By making it sustainable, we implemented a whole set of uh, standard, standard technologies. Lots of insulation, really good quality windows, heat recovery, actually energy recovery ventilation, uh, high efficiency lighting, on and on and on. Uh, but all the design decisions were made in the early 2000s. You could do much, much better today. So how much did it yield for us? Well, we use 70% less energy for heating and cooling. We have a heavy heating load in the winter and a cooling load in the summer. 70% less energy for heating and cooling than the standard building we could have built by building code. Huge. Actually, it exceeded the projections. We thought it would be 50% better, but we, we did even better. Now. That means we save a lot of money on operating expense, but it must have cost a lot more to build it, right? You gotta pay for extra insulation and windows and high efficiency lighting and, and the energy recovery ventilation system and so on and so on. It must have cost a lot more. So, instant pop quiz. Does anybody here think that the capital cost, forget the operating savings, just the capital cost of the building were less than the standard building we could have built? Nobody, one person. How about about the same? So a few hands. Up to 10% more. 10 to 20. That's the most so far. 
more than 20. There's quite a few still. So that's typical. The modal answer is 20% more. That's completely wrong. Let me show you what we did. We did an audit, and we calculated the incremental cost, the marginal cost, of all the sustainability features. And yeah, you can see here, we did spend more on the windows, and we did spend more on the insulation, and we did spend more on the lighting, and we spent more on the high efficiency air conditioning system, and so on, and so on, and so on. But there were offsetting savings, which you can see here. Because it uses less energy, the mechanical systems are much smaller and much less expensive. The electrical substation to feed the building power is much smaller and much less expensive, and so forth. So you add it all up, including the cost of our lead application, that's the equivalent of your building standards here, and our green consultant, and the total extra costs were about $2.3 million on a $140 million project. That's 1.6%. But as they say on late night television, wait, there's more. Because MIT, as the owner and operator of our facilities, we are responsible for providing the chilled water to cool our buildings and the steam to heat them in the wintertime. And because we use so much less energy, we built for half. We used much less than that, but we built for half. We saved another almost $2 million in avoided capital infrastructure. So the bottom line of that is we spent $2.3 million more on the building we then saved another 1.9 million on the infrastructure. So the net cost of building a green building was $340,000. That's a quarter of a percent. Sustainability was free. And we have lower operating expenses forever. And this is a conservative estimate. So what are the savings? Well, the payback time was trivial. It was seven months. And the net present value of what we did was almost $10 million. The largest donation we got for the building was a very generous gift from Bill and Joan Porter. Bill is a Sloan alum, and he invented E-Trade. He invented electronic stock trading. They gave $20 million, a very generous gift. This was $10 million. So by building the building green, it's like we had another major donor. So it's technically possible. It's a, there's a business case for much of this. Not everything, but there's a good business case for much of it. And now the question is, how do we get folks around the world from where we are now, which is we don't believe it, we think it's going to destroy the economy, it's too expensive, we're not willing to cut because the rich nations created the problem, so the poor countries aren't willing to do so. That has to, has to disappear. So how are, we, how are we working on that? So this little role play that we just did is one way that we're working on that. We call it the World Climate Simulation, and it's been played all over the world, and it works. We published an article earlier this year documenting that the people who participate in the negotiation, and you had a little taste of it, but you know, over the course of several hours, the people who do that, they come away changed. They come away not only knowing more about climate change, but feeling the urgency of action, feeling it. Not just knowing it. You got to know it. You got to be able to refer to the science, but that's not enough. You got to feel it in your gut. And they come away not only feeling the urgency, but feeling that it is possible to do something about this instead of just being in a place of helplessness and despair. Now, let me just show you a real quick example. So, this is an example of some high school kids in the United States negotiating just like you did. The gentleman sitting down here, he's the United States, and the other folks are trying to persuade him that he should cut more and help pay for them to cut their emissions. So, there's a lot of learning going on. They're learning how to negotiate. They're learning about public speaking. They're learning about what kind of arguments work. They're learning how to create shared value. You want the United States to do something? You better show why it's in their interest. That's learning happening. We, I ran it in Paris with our team, and this young man over here uh, was a high school student uh, at the time uh, from China, from Beijing. And uh, well, here he is. I made him 
I made him uh, take the role of President Obama, and he's giving a speech here about what the United States would do. And here he is negotiating on behalf of the United States. This is a high school kid. We, we can see that if we see the globally ambitious plan, we can contribute $50 billion to global founding at the base of So what's happening here? What's happening here is people are learning for themselves. I don't tell them what their emissions need to be. If I did, you would sit there and go, forget it, no way. But you decided, based on the consequences of the decisions that you make, we know from our research and from the stories that our students and colleagues tell us that this changes people. And people have gone out after participating in this, they've learned how to run it themselves, and then they take it to their communities. They've changed their careers, they've put solar on their house, they've insulated their homes and their businesses, and it is spreading. So as of this week, there's been over 1,100 uh, such events in 85 countries around the world with 50,000 participants that we know of all over the world, especially in the developing countries as well as the developed. It's absolutely free. It's all fully available. You can get everything that you saw here tonight at climateinteractive.org, and you can then learn how to run the workshop Take it to your university, take it to your middle school, your high school, take it to your business, take it to your government so that they can learn for themselves. This is something we can do. So people ask me, am I an optimist about climate change? How can I possibly be optimistic? Well, I'm not. There's an old joke that says, the optimist proclaims this is the best of all possible worlds. And the pessimist says, yep. I don't believe this is the best of all possible worlds. We can do better. So I'm not an optimist in that sense. I'm not making a prediction it's all going to turn out OK, because it's not unless we get busy. I'm hopeful. I believe we can do it. I believe it's technically possible, economically profitable in many cases, affordable in every other case, and we can do it. But only if each and every one of us gets busy, gets up, and gets out there right now to make a difference. So let's go. We can do it. Thanks a lot. So now that you've negotiated your own agreement, if we have time for a few questions, it's up to you, Lux. Great. So who's got a comment or a question? And I think uh, we want people to go to the microphones. So go ahead, sir. But why don't you come over to the mic right here? Yeah, yellow shirt right there. Go ahead. Very quick two questions. Um, firstly, what would be, you showed us the reduction scenario um, when, you, when you switched on the Firefox browser. So um, what would be the impact of that reduction scenario on economic growth or coming closer to real life, like incomes in everyday life of people? Because yeah. I've noticed that people, when you ask them that you would have to reduce these emissions, the first thing they think is, whether I will get this kind of modern uh, uh, modern society's benefit or that one, would I have to give yep. up my PlayStation or something like that? Yep. So that's a great question. And uh, so two quick points on this. First of all, it's a very contentious area. And economists don't agree, and they don't really know what it's going to cost, other than it's a lot cheaper than everybody thinks. So on the one hand, as we just saw with the example of the building, everybody thinks it's enormously expensive to build a green building, and it's not. It's basically free if you do it right. And I've got a paper you can read on my website about how, how we did that. And lots and lots of other buildings have been, uh, have been built with those kinds of, or even better uh, energy performance, and the costs are just as low or even lower. Uh, in our own house, for example, we did a deep energy retrofit three, three years ago. Uh, 1928 house, very inefficient, terrible heating system, single pane, lousy windows, very leaky. If you turn the heat off in the winter, like right now, it's about minus eight degrees at our house. If you turn the heat off, within an hour, you'd be cold. It was that leaky. So we did a deep energy retrofit on the house. The house needed a, a re renovation in any case. The incremental cost 
of the extra insulation, the quality windows, and all the other things that we did, quite manageable. And the result is, and then we have solar on the roof now, and the result is that over the last three years, we have made 50% more energy than we use with no fossil fuel whatsoever. So now we are power producers. We have no heating bill, we have no electric bill, and our electric utility owes us $3,000 right now. And it was highly affordable. So the big myth is that raising the price of carbon energy, putting the regulations in, according to the scenario that you guys developed, would bankrupt the economy. It's just not true. On the contrary, in many places, it would improve the economy, create jobs, improve economic resilience, and put money in your pocket. And the way you got to think about it is there's co-benefits. If China cuts coal, it's not only going to help the climate problem in years to come, but it's going to improve public health right now, today. Hundreds of thousands of people in China have lung disease and are dying prematurely every year because of the air pollution, most of which is the result of burning coal and other fossil fuels. You stop doing that, and the savings in the health budget are estimated to be three times larger than the cost of cutting your emissions, not to mention fewer people are going to die. And if we don't do that, then a lot more people are going to be harmed and die. So the cost of doing nothing very greatly outweighs the cost of taking action. But it's a psychological problem. People don't think it, that it's possible. So we need this kind of interactive experience to help them understand that actually this is the greatest entrepreneurial and economic opportunity. Getting off of carbon is the greatest entrepreneurial and economic opportunity since the Industrial Revolution. Go ahead. Um, just a very short question. What is your personal um, opinion or expectation of what's going to happen in COP24 over the next few days and weeks? So I'm, uh, I'm expecting very little, uh, to, be, to be perfectly honest. Uh, and, and here's the reason. You know, in Paris, and we were all there, it was, it was a very uplifting time, you know, and everybody felt great after they signed it as compared to the depression we all felt after Copenhagen. Uh, but we also knew that the agreement was far, far from sufficient. And you saw this already. Paris gets you 3.3, not nearly good enough. But imagine what would have happened if every nation in the world in Paris had come up with a great agreement that really would have limited warming to one and a half degrees. What would happen? That means every country's emissions would have to fall. And I showed you, including all the developing economies, their emissions would have to fall globally now. So that by mid-century, we're basically off of carbon. What would have happened if that great agreement had been reached when it came back for ratification and implementation in Washington, in Brussels, in Jakarta, in Beijing, here in Singapore, in Kuala Lumpur, what would have happened? It would be dead on arrival. And why is that? Because there isn't enough public support, grassroots support for action. How can we expect our political leaders to raise the price of gasoline, even though it's quite affordable economically? How can we expect them to do that if there isn't enough support for them to take that action? They can only go so far without that broad base of support. And that's why we're doing this. Our theory of change is, yes, we need to keep bringing our models and our analysis and our uh, interactive process to the policymakers. We're going to keep briefing our senior leaders. I'm going to be in Washington a lot over the next year or so trying to do that with the new Congress. And it's still not enough. We've got to bring it out to the public. So 50,000 people have done this so far around the world, 85 countries. That's not nearly enough. So one thing you can do, you can learn how to run this yourself. Everything you need is freely available on this website. And then you bring it to your constituency. You bring it to your faith community, your, your neighbors, your business, your student colleagues, and your government so that they can discover for themselves how we can get this done. That's the way I think it's going to happen. Okay. So, uh, 
let's say that I'm, I'm only like a high school student and I am really, really like ultra conservative and I might believe that the world is flat. Uh, is, you, is there sorry, a, you think the earth is flat? No, okay. let, let's say for, ex, uh, for example, how can like this sort of science reach me? So I think you're being quite unfair to conservatives. <laughs> Seriously. I'm a, rib, I'm, I'm, I'm a liberal. <laughs> I, I got that, right? Because most conservatives would not describe themselves as flat earthers. Um, so, so I think you are being quite unfair here. And it's that kind of, and I don't mean to pick on you, but it's that kind of demonizing the other side, whatever the, your other side is. Everybody seems to have another side that blocks action here. We need everybody. We need everybody. And uh, so, you know, a lot of these events that, that I showed you on that map have happened in conservative parts of the United States or other countries. We typically have, so I, you know, I, I teach at MIT in the management school. We have MBA students who skew more conservatively than the typical college student, let's say. Um, they, many of them voted, vote Republican. Many of them uh, don't like big government. They don't like government regulation. It's very different in the United States than it is here. Uh, and here's what's interesting. I mentioned the study that we did where we, we evaluated the impact of this simulation experience. The conservatives learned the most, gained the most in urgency, and came away equally motivated to take action as everybody else. And I think that's another sign to be hopeful. So get out there and bring it to conservatives because they care about their children and they care about everybody's children just as much as you do. Okay, Locks, I guess that was the last question. Thank you all very, very much. Okay, uh, the discussion could go on and on. I'm, I'm sorry for being a showstopper. Yeah. But we have already gone 45 minutes over the yeah. planned schedule. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, no, no, it was a delightful <laughs> seminar. So the time just went by, right? Just like that. So uh, let's put our hands together again for Professor John Sturman. For Thank you. Lecture. And I'll request uh, our rector, uh, Professor Chu Chia Beng, to present a small memento to the uh, uh, speaker today. John, thank you very much. Thank you. It's an excellent view of. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you very much.